hitting coach Donnie Ecker seemingly helped the Giants reach new heights in 2020 and in 2021 when they won 107 games and he's gone on to Texas where he's had similar success uh, with the offensive group there. And reporting is he could be a potential front runner for the Giants' vacant managerial position. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspik, and on this show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday, talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. Uh, We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Check us out there. Please hit that subscribe button wherever it is that you're following the show. And coming up on today's show, as I said, we've got a managerial search update. And it's not just about Donnie Ecker, but Donnie Ecker is certainly where I want to begin that conversation. And the reporting is from Susan Slusser, of course, one of the best, if not the best in the business, uh, reporting that... Here's the quote. Here it is. Quote, a former member of the San Francisco staff is also expected to be among the potential front runners for the job. Donnie Ecker, the hitting coach for the Giants 107 win team in 2021, is the bench coach for the ALCS bound Rangers under Bruce Bochy, who won three World Series with San Francisco. And so, yeah, end quote. Um, She also goes on to say, Texas's deep playoff run will make Ecker, who's 37, among the hottest managerial candidates this offseason. And first of all, like people's reaction to the Texas Rangers having the success that they've had, I think there's probably a tendency to be like Bruce Bochy. But I, I point more and say Donnie Ecker, because, I mean, if you just look at what they did offensively this year, they... I mean, and it's not just, okay, yeah, they went out and signed Corey Seager and Marcus Simeon, and that's that. That's the end of the story. They're getting great production out of Adolis Garcia, good production out of Jonah Heim, good production out of Josh Young, Laody Tavares, good production, Nathaniel Lowe, good production, Mitch Garver, great production, Uh, Evan Carter, like just up and down their team, they just got, you know, numerous players had a lot of offensive success as a result if we were to search uh by and you know Corey. by the way and just like with buster posey and brandon crawford having like career years you look at the year that Corey seager had uh phenomenal i mean a 169 weighted runs created plus the dude hit 327 390 on base 623 slugging and another good year from marcus simeon so a, those are good signings. Wish the Giants had uh, jumped on those players. But B, the overall team weighted runs created plus for the Texas Rangers was 114, which was fourth best in Major League Baseball. The Giants were all the way down at 21st with a weighted runs created plus of 93, meaning about 7% below average, whereas the Rangers were about 14% above average. And I don't think it's all based on personnel so last year with the rangers i know they started out a bit slow but they ended up the giants had a 103 weighted runs created plus the texas rangers were only at 96 and ecker was there last year to be clear and so maybe you know you can make an argument that it takes took a year to like took two years to kind of get things rolling with them because it's not like they added major offensive pieces and yet you saw this huge improvement. Corey Seager and Simeon were signed prior to that, you know, two years ago, 2022. But if you look at the Giants, kind of the same thing happened in 2020 and then 2021. Whereas 2020, they saw improvement from being really bad in 2019 
And then in 2021, things just took off where the Giants had a uh, we've got to take pitchers out of the equations uh, out of the equation because they weigh the numbers down. Their non-pitcher weighted runs created plus was 115, tied with the Houston Astros for the best in Major League Baseball, and it was the best in the National League. The Giants were the best offensive team in the National League when Donnie Ecker, look, he was one of three hitting coaches. Justin Veeley was already here under Donnie Ecker. Uh, Dustin Lind was also there, but Donnie Ecker was the third piece, and he's the one who left. And my understanding is he's like the guru among them all. Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, but the the proof is a little bit in the pudding. And when we look at the Giants in 2021, it wasn't just uh, Posey and Crawford having like the best seasons of their careers. Although let's just let's not look past the fact that they had like the best seasons of their careers. And so, is it a total coincidence, or does Donnie Ecker have some magic? That he's working, and you look at Brandon Belt was fifty nine percent above average. Darren Ruff, who then fell off in a major way afterwards, uh, was forty four percent above average offensively. Posey forty one percent above average. Crawford forty percent above average. These are just ridiculous numbers that the Giants put up that year. Longoria twenty three percent above average. Tyro best season that he it was a fifty two game sample for him. Uh, 19% above average, Wade, 18%. So just on and on and on, you didn't really see that many struggles. I mean, if we look at, okay, like Jalen Davis, he had nine plate appearances. That's not going to count. Mike Talkman struggled when he was here. Jason Vossler struggled. Mauricio Dubon struggled. To- uh, Tommy Lastella st- struggled, although he was closer to average than terrible. Alex Dickerson wasn't great. Blah, blah, blah. But like some of the guys at the top, it's just phenomenal. And we're seeing the same thing in Texas. And I just want to go on record and say, I think I was the first person to float this idea. And I will tell you, I floated the idea. The everydayers will will back me up on this. Those who heard me say it at the time. I floated the idea of Donnie Ecker being the Giants manager for 2024 before Gabe Kapler was fired. And it was after... uh, What's his name? I'm uh, Johnson. Greg Johnson uh, came out and said, Gabe Kapler and Farhan Zaidi will be back in 2024. I said, well, you know what? You can say that, but it doesn't mean it's set in stone. Like you can always change uh, your position on that. Just because you say it does not mean you have to stick to it. And it was at that time. I also said like, will be back doesn't necessarily mean we'll be back in the same role. But regardless, it was around that time when I the Giants were falling apart and I just said, look, I think they need to shake things up and there's, they're not just going to roll back with the same leadership group. And so I, I sensed that a, a Gabe Kapler firing could be possible. And then my first idea was like, the only way you can get Donnie Ecker back, assuming he's still under contract with the Rangers for more than just this year, which might not even be true, but I assume it's it would be year three. It was probably at least a three-year contract would be my guess. And, uh, you know, he's not going to overtake Bochi as the manager in Texas. And so the only way you could, like, get permission to interview him for a job with you if he's under contract with another team is if it's a promotion. And the only kind of promotion that you could give is manager. And so it makes so much sense here. I know I previously made my episode of Vote for Stephen Vote, and I love Stephen Vote, but uh, if they really believe that Donnie Ecker was like the mastermind behind what they were able to do offensively and what's going on in Texas offensively, and you look at some of their playoff games and just how they're rolling right through teams offensively, like if you're crediting Bochi, I just think you're kind of missing what's going on there. Like look at like the offensive explosions what does that really have to do with the manager? And if you're saying Donnie Ecker would be the manager, the thing is he would hire a coaching staff. And you could offer him, just like the Rangers offered him a position I had never heard of, one that I don't think ever existed before, which was bench coach and offensive coordinator. Offensive coordinator, that's not even usually a baseball position, but it meant 
he was in charge from major leagues to minor leagues of their of their offensive kind of scheme and like just development and offer him the same position except an upgrade manager and offensive coordinator boom bang done so that is definitely interesting so coming up in just a minute there's more to get into we're going to switch gears and get into uh pete patella the giants general manager whom we haven't really seen around uh he was spotted he was spotted in uh south korea and what was he doing there? We'll get into it momentarily. And before we do, today's episode is brought to you by my favorite app and our good, good friends over at Sleeper. The MLB playoffs are here, which means the clock's ticking on your chance to win 100 times your cash on daily fantasy baseball. Baseball's never been more exciting than it is right now with studs like Bryce Harper, uh, Shohei Otani, not in the playoffs, but... Uh, on the American League side, Corey Seager, Marcus Simeon, Jordan Alvarez, Jose Altuve, just a ton of stars and a lot of playoff action. And you can just simply pick more or less on your favorite baseball stats for these players in the postseason, like home runs, hits, strikeouts, and more for up to a 100 times payout on Sleeper. Get your picks right and you could win big. What I love about the app is just how, how many options you have. You can pick uh, any of the games, any of the playoff games, certainly, and scroll through any player and just pick more or less on a number of different stats, whichever one you feel more comfortable uh, making a pick on, and you can do it in under a minute. So use promo code Locked On, and you'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's Terms of Use for details. All right, as promised, more talk about this. It wasn't just Donnie Eckerd that got mentioned in this Susan Slusser article, but uh, he was the one I focused on the most because I think the other person who was mentioned maybe is less likely. And we're also going to get into the Pete Patella sighting in South Korea, which is super interesting, Pete Patella being the GM of the San Francisco Giants. And people often ask me, like, what's up with this guy like he's nowhere to be seen well he was just randomly seen in South Korea so what was he doing there I'll tell you thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day every day is on Monday breaking down the latest with the Giants managerial search and we've also got a boatload of mailbag questions left over so uh it's kind of a mystery bag with with this big, big, big deal of a search going on behind the scenes and stuff starting to leak out. And so we'll have the latest for you on Monday. But I just want to mention in this Slusser article, the main point was that third base coach Mark Hallberg uh, is, quote, emerging as the top in-house candidate for the team's open managerial position. The Chronicle has learned that Hallberg, who's also 37, interviewed for the job this week. Uh, The team was also expected to interview others from within the organization, including bench coach Kai Correa and former third base coach Ron Wotus, who is now a special advisor for or to the team. Hallberg, who is a close friend of Buster Posey from college, has a sharp mind and is calm and even tempered, well regarded by everyone in the organization. And then she goes on to talk about Donnie Ecker as well. But for me, I think, like, I don't know. I just think that Ecker is a better candidate. Without knowing Hallberg personally, I think that someone who can bring, potentially bring you back offensively, help you, like, just guys weren't the same. I mean, look at Brandon Crawford, the year he had in 2021. Was it just a total fluke? It just makes me, I just don't think it is when you're looking at Belt did the same. Posey did the same. Crawford did what he did. And then down the line, like Darren Ruff did what he did. And a lot of these guys just just stopped playing that way after Ecker left. And then, you know, in Texas, we're seeing similar results. And it's not just led by Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager, even though those guys are doing what the, the stars of the Giants did, which was perform to the best of their abilities. Whereas... When the giant like Crawford was fourth place MVP in 2021, and then he became like unplayable uh, in 2023, just two years later. And so, 
I don't know. I just think Ecker is a super strong candidate, and he's also from the Bay Area, as far as I know. I know he coached at, like, Los Altos High School or something. I need to pull up his page and reread about him, but super intrigued by Donnie Ecker. But speaking of intrigue, what the heck is the Giants general manager doing in South Korea? Well, Pete Patella, it was funny. I came across this from a tweet uh, on from uh, Ben Likes Giants, one of my, uh, someone I follow and who follows me on Twitter, Ben, great name, uh, who says, kind of funny that we basically hear nothing about Patella all year, and then he just randomly pops up in a KBO video. And so there's this video of this player, Jung-Hoo, Jung-Hoo Lee, uh, who was having his last at bat for the heroes, his team in the KBO, uh, I guess on October 10th, a few days ago. And in the video, you you just watch like the last at bat and, and him like giving a send off to the fans or whatever. And then all of a sudden the camera cuts and there's Pete Patella, the Giants general manager, just standing by himself, like clapping for uh, Jung Hoo Lee. And so obviously the Giants are scouting Jung Hoo Lee. Okay. And so that's not like a huge breaking news. I think even just a few days ago, there was a report that came out that Patella was already there. And so I think he spent quite some time there, maybe a week or so, um, scouting Jung Hoo Lee, who's a center fielder, has won multiple gold gloves, crazy, crazy low strikeout rate. Um, I don't know what exactly the comp would be. I'm not an expert on like uh, looking at numbers from the KBO and translating them to what would that be in Major League Baseball? But Farhan Zaidi was asked about Jung Hoo Lee by uh, Alex Pavlovich on a recent podcast following up on that end of season press conference. It looked like immediately afterwards they recorded a little podcast together. And Jung Hoo Lee from Korea and Yoshinobu Yamamoto from Japan were brought up by Pavlovich. And basically, uh, Zaidi indicated that the Giants do have interest in both of these players. And so Jung Hoo Lee, like I said, a center fielder who's won a lot of gold gloves, makes a lot of contact. I saw him play some in the World Baseball Classic. Kind of just like a maybe the hit tool is really, really good. Maybe the power is a little bit more of a question. Uh, But one of the things Farhan Zaidi said about Jung Hoo Lee was that maybe the success of of, uh, Ha Sung Kim with the Padres makes a Jung Hoo Lee even, it kind of elevates the projection because you saw a good, good player like in Korea in Ha Sung Kim translate and become really good. You know, the defense certainly has translated. Ha Sung Kim is just a really good player now, even though he struggled in his first season. And so it's certainly interesting that the Giants general manager is there. And just to like clear things up, uh, Scott Harris, when he was the general manager here, he was the same way. Like, he wasn't public-facing. The president of baseball operations, Farhan Zaidi, he's the one who faces the media, not all the time, but when when there is media to face, he's the one who faces them. And Pete Patella just kind of uh, is free to not have to get involved in that. And it's unfortunate I would like to hear a different voice, but... He is obviously, like, the idea that he's just not doing anything is obviously silly and ridiculous. So he's doing things. It's just not, you just don't see them. He's doing things such as traveling to South Korea for a week to scout a player who they're interested in and who's going to be posted this offseason. And I'm sure he or someone else, you know, in on Yoshinobu Yamamoto, a pitcher who's going to get probably an enormous contract from what I understand, uh, starting pitcher, Farhan called him one of the best pitchers in the world. And he said, I know that sounds like an exaggeration, but it's not. And so when you hear that and you look at the free agent class and it's pretty weak, generally, here are a couple of players who add a lot of intrigue to that free agent class. So it's kind of like, where in the world is Pete Patella? Like where in time or where in the world is Carmen San Diego? That's what this reminded me of. It's like, oh, there's a look. It's a random KBO video. And there, there he is. Finally, we see Pete Patella. And it's like, nobody could find him, but the KBO camera crew. So I just thought that was funny and also interesting. 
as we get closer and closer to actual free agency. I don't know exactly when these guys are going to be posted. The posting window expanded. It used to be 30 days. I think now it's like 45 or even 60. So that's uh, something to consider. I wish it was shorter, but I think it has gotten longer under the new collective bargaining agreement. So anyway, just thought that was interesting. So uh, coming up in just a minute, we're actually going to switch gears and get into a few more mailbag questions. Like I said, I have, I'm sitting on like probably a hundred mailbag questions that are pretty recent. And so we're going to get through some, including which part of 2023 was the outlier for the offense because they were good in the beginning and then they were absolutely terrible for the last several months. So what's the deal with that and which one is the truth? So I will answer that question and maybe even more in just a minute. And before we do, today's episode is brought to you by none other than our terrific and great friends over at FanDuel. October baseball is back. Sadly, the Giants aren't in it, but it's been exciting and really fun nonetheless. And you can make your postseason debut with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Join FanDuel today and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to create your new account. Then you can get in on the action from the first pitch until the final out. Bet on everything from strikeouts to home runs to who will win the game. And if you don't want to wait for the whole game even to get a W, predict what will happen in the next at bat with quick bets. So head on over to FanDuel.com slash locked on right now. Uh, step up to the plate this postseason with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, as promised, we're going to get to some mailbag questions, or at least one. I, t you know, I j tend to take forever, even if I intend not to. Um, thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. I know this episode is coming out late in the day. I'm, I've had scheduling conflicts, but we're still your team every day and we're making it work. Um, so I apologize for the inconsistency. I'm working on being more consistent every day, but we're we expect an episode every day nonetheless. Um, and every day is on Monday. We'll have the latest for you. I expect and hope for news on the managerial search. If not, we've got a ton of mailbag questions and a lot of other ideas out there for each and every day uh, for you moving forward as the off season gets going. It's no longer about 2023. Thankfully, we get to turn the page a little bit, but actually, no, we don't because the first mailbag question that I'm going to get to is about 2023. And it's from Mike who says, which or how much of an outlier was the Giants' miserable offensive performance the last three months of the season? And I guess the same question for April through June. Did they overperform during that period? And so, like, the boring and probably maybe correct answer is that they are a combination of it all, which is such a boring answer, but... Like it all counts. I would count the, the the what they did initially, and I would count what they did afterwards. However, if if the question, let me read this carefully again. How much of an outlier was the Giants' miserable last three months? It, I think it was a significant outlier because they're they're not like the worst offensive team in baseball. But the the date I always looked at was June twenty fifth. That's when things like started to go south. And so if we look at June twenty fifth. Um, the Giants had a 79 weighted runs created plus from that point onwards, which was second worst in Major League Baseball ahead of only the lowly Colorado Rockies who lost, I believe, over 100 games and were just, you know, a punching bag for the league. The Rockies lost 103 games. And this weighted runs created plus number, by the way, takes into account the ballpark which, you know, the Rockies play in a very hitter-friendly park. So they probably outscored the Giants by quite a bit. But that doesn't mean, like, during this period, yeah, they scored nearly 100 more runs than the Giants, and yet they come out ranking as worse offensively because it's making that adjustment 
that the Rock, like if the Giants played in Coors, they they would score a lot more runs. If the Giants played half their games there, they would score a lot more runs. That's obvious, right? So anyway, are the Giants the second worst offensive team in baseball? I don't think so. And what's funny is if you look at this list, the Arizona Diamondbacks who find themselves in the NLCS are fourth worst, but they were at they were at 88 and the Giants were at 79. So there was like a big drop off. The Giants were just terrible. I mean, 21% below average. And according to offensive runs above average, essentially, about 84 runs below average were the Giants starting on June 25th. And that's covering 85 games. So that is about exactly half the season, a little more than half the season. So I think that that's a pretty significant outlier. Like if you replayed the season, I don't think that that happens often. Like if you if you re-simmed the season 100 times or 10,000 times, I think this is a pretty low probability outcome. I would not have put money on Giants being the second worst offensive team for the last 85 games of the season. Now, if we go, it's important, I think, to follow up and say, well, what did they do before this? If we go from the start of the season through June 24th, where were they? And this is where it it hits home for me. It's not like they were blowing the world away. They were more good but not great for the first uh, uh, 77 games of the season when they had a 107 weighted runs created plus. And I think that's more reasonable. I think that's like what they expected. I mean, it's not crazy. It's nothing... By the way, the Diamondbacks were also at 107. So both teams were much worse in the second half. But, I mean, 107 is sounds like a reasonable number. 79 or whatever it was is an unreasonable number. For weighted runs created plus, 100 is average. So if you're at 107, it means 7% above average. The top teams, Tampa Bay was 25% above average during that span to begin the year. Atlanta was 20% above average. Texas was 15% above average. So it looks like for Texas, they made they were like more consistent because they ended up at what, 114 is what I said earlier in the show. And so that would have been nice. If the Giants could have just kept at 107, they probably would have coasted into the playoffs. So the offensive collapse really, really, really doomed them and was behind what happened because... At that point, this was around right after they had won 10 games in a row. And they, you know, their season high, they were 13 games over 500. And if they could have just played 500 baseball, they would have easily made the playoffs. Easily. The Diamondbacks got in with 84 wins. Giants got, Giants ended up with 79 wins, only five fewer. And 84 wins is nowhere close to 13 games over 500. And so, even just yeah so my answer is that the it it was a pretty like look even if they have been like 10% below average in in the last 85 games they probably would have made the playoffs it was just being as terrible as they were that that hurt them for such a long period i mean more than half the season that's crazy and all the more reason i say you know if 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 you really truly believe that donny ecker could help you turn that around. Obviously, you need better players too. They need to, they just need to upgrade their offense, I think. But at the same time, I mean, wow, what a miserable collapse that was. I don't really see that April through June. Like, there's nothing outlier, too outlier ish about those numbers, except maybe they had a 315 average on balls in play, which was sixth highest in baseball. And you know, higher than the league average during that span. League average was 297 on average on balls in play, and they were at 315. So I guess there's there is some outlier type data there, but their power also just completely fell apart. They were at 166 for isolated power, which was 13th. It wasn't great. It's not like they were hitting for a ton of power. Uh Maybe they're both slightly out. I mean, maybe the first one is slightly outlierish, and maybe the second one is extremely outlierish. So it, it was just a weird season, and I'm I'm not making excuses for them. Like I said initially, my my ultimate answer is kind of like 
they both happened. And so I, I kind of think if you combine them together, that's kind of the truth. Uh, but the way it was like broken up into first half essentially, and then second half, and it was like solid slash good and then terrible. If it had been more of a mixture, if they had just been consistently about five to 10% below average, like maybe that's what, what I call them is like five to 10% below average. It just wasn't consistent at all. It was like solid and then absolutely abysmal. And so, as I said, I went long on that one question. That is why I sit on like a hundred mailbag questions because I go long, I go into detail. It's both a positive trait and maybe a negative one. You decide. Let me know in the comments. Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day, every dayers. On Monday, we'll be back with the latest. We've got more mailbag questions. As I said, no matter what the topic is, and right now with the managerial search, we're, we're on the edge of our seats every moment for possible updates there. And that's going to get resolved like in a matter of a couple weeks. And so, or, you know, two to three weeks. And so that's really exciting and be back every day for the latest. So once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter or X at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. It helps me out so much. So thank you in advance. And thanks to everyone who's done so already. I can't wait to be with you again on Monday. Have a great weekend. So thanks again for listening. You are now Locked on Giants.